what I want to do today was make the next step uh, in talking about fluid flow equations. So big picture is that we look, we'd like to look at uh, fluid mass flow, liquid flow, fluid mass transport, contaminant transport, and heat flow, and solid mechanics. Those are the systems we'd like to look at. We've chosen fluid pressure flow because three of those systems look almost identical to each other. Uh, with a dependent variable of either pressure, temperature, or concentration. And if we understand the flow system, then we understand everything uh, everything about those other three, for starters. And so that's a, a prelude to talking about combining them to, together in, in some way. Um, all of the work that we've done so far in terms of fluid flow has involved, if I plug it in, might be a good start. Uh, yes, has involved uh, this relationship of, to write it in the same context as you have here, kH equals Q. And we know how to deal with that because we know exactly what this K matrix is, the conductance matrix, and we've talked about that in, in some, some detail. But that is only for steady problems, problems where we solve this relationship, which is Ax equals b, basically, uh, linear system of equations, solve for the unknowns, and then we have them at, at one place in time. When we look at transient behavior, uh, our, we have to modify that slightly. And the uh, PDE that represents that looks something like it has a, a time-dependent term on it, uh, being equal to a hydraulic conductivity term, and a second order partial differential, whoops, not P, right? Uh, H dx squared. So that's a, a one dimensional rendition of um, the diffusion equation. It is the diffusion equation. Uh, it's, it's diffusion equation when it includes this term. The, prop, the quantity that is diffusing is not, uh, is head, not. Um, uh, mass, but it is a diffusion equation because it looks like a, a diffusion equation for solute, for instance. And so this term we have talked about before, uh, it manifests itself as an extra term in the, the linearized finite element equation, which this expression is here. And so to be able to solve that, I suppose we have to do a couple of things. We have to figure out, first of all, what the uh, the S matrix is, and we'll find we know from our previous derivations that in the terminology that we've used already, it's some coefficient. This would be specific storage in hydrologic terms, uh, and multiplied by the quantities, which are the shape functions squared or the transpose of one multiplied by the other. It's done over the volume of the element. And uh, we know what the shape functions are because we've used them already to be able to do things like calculate the head at a particular location as a function of the nodal values of head. And we've spent some time dealing with that. And so the first thing is we have to figure out how to be able to get this matrix. The other aside is, I don't really, really uh, go back through this, but we've made the point that all second-order PDEs that represent our case, oh my goodness, so this term here is always embodied in a relationship which has the form, if I can get it in here, this A transpose DA, it's got a delay on the typing for some reason, but the for this second order PDE, the matrix relationship always, always looks like this. And so this is the conductance matrix for flow. Uh, substituting a different term for the constituent relationship will give us uh, the, the appropriate relationship for heat transport, Fourier's law, and the appropriate uh, law also for uh, mass transport using fixed law as the diffusion coefficient in here. And it will always look like this, where we have zeroth order expressions, which is really what this is, zeroth order in time, uh, space, but first order in time. And so we can think of that as zeroth order in space. They will always look something like this. 
And so we derive this, so I won't rederive it. And it's our job to maybe be able to, to use it in some useful way. But we, we know what the components are. So that's the first thing that we have to, to deal with. The second thing that we have to deal with to deal with um, time-dependent problems is to be able to realize that this extra term here is just the same as the rate of change of uh, heads as a function of time. And in the same way as we can do that for a value of a head at a point, we could also do it for the nodal values of head. And so this expression represents just this is this normal engineering terminology, overscripted dot just means a time derivative. And so if we want to be able to solve this equation here, it doesn't quite look like ax equals b, which is really what we're solving here. This is kind of the, just mathematically how you write it. So we're not solving a system of linear equations. We have an extra term in it that we have to figure out how to deal with. And so that's the second part that we need to, to deal with. We'll deal with both today. Uh, hopefully we'll get through it so we can use this little MATLAB code and also COMSOL. I'd like to try COMSOL in here as well to see what the connection is like. I guess uh, Yi used it um, relatively effectively uh, without problems uh, the other day. I remember last time I, I tried using it two years ago that uh, it always used to have a problem because of the, the internet in the classroom was a bit slow and also used to only run COMSOL on certain nodes. So if you got into the wrong node, it actually wouldn't have COMSOL there. So it's, we'll, we'll deal with that uh, bridge when we come to it. Okay, I like red. So let's go back to red. All right. So first things first. This is our expression that represents this uh, diffusion equation. It has a uh, matrix that represents the conductance matrix. It has a component that represents an overall flux that's applied over the surface of the element. So if you're looking at plan view of a mesh, then this would be the rainfall rate, for instance, that was being pushed into the system as a function of time, and it's over the area of the uh, mesh. This would represent the, the storage matrix, or I think we would probably refer to it as a capacitance matrix. because it has this uh, delay uh, capacitance feature to it. And these are the boundary conditions for the, the nodal fluxes that we apply. So in shorthand, uh, we can write this relationship as this. We'll use tau to represent the time at any time we particularly want to define the relationship. And that will come important in the ways that we choose to be able to represent this, this time derivative. And so the two things we need to do are parts actually labeled in this order as well. Figure out exactly what the S matrix is first, and then figure out exactly how to deal with this term dt dt, which has fallen off the bottom there. So those are the two, two things to do. We know what the con this capacitance matrix looks like, and so perhaps we can move through it relatively straightforwardly. Uh, we talked last time about uh, isoparametric elements, and the time before that about one-dimensional isoparametric elements where the shape functions were defined in terms of shape functions which looked something like, I think, uh, a half, one plus r, and one minus r, or the other way around. You can work out which, which, whether, whether those should be transposed or not. Uh, but in this case, and so we could do it in terms of that. Um, I think we probably will do sometime in the future. But we can also do it in terms of the regular shape functions defined in terms of these uh, global coordinates of x. And so um, we know that this relationship with these underscored regions are just shape functions. We know that the shape functions allow us to map both um, head and pressure. So in other words, the heads at any particular location are given by the product of the shape functions and the nodal heads. Nodal heads only exist at the nodes, nowhere else. And so if we substitute this relationship here into here for these two terms, then you just get this uh, term below. I guess the other thing that we've done this before is that we can also write that this volume term is just dx dy 
and dz. And we know that the integral um, dy dz, in other words, the two dimensions here, just give us this area. It's constant, it doesn't need to be constant. And so the transition, if you like, from this to this is to just take this area outside. This is a material property. Um, doesn't matter uh, what that is for now. And if we make the substitutions, this is B transposed. This is B. Um, the individual products of these terms, so this times this is this term here. This times this is this term here, etc. And so we really only have um, two kinds of uh, functions in this matrix. One that looks like this, and one that looks like this. So the two uh, integrals we have, and if we take those integrals individually, you can do it however you like. Here, just uh, multiplying out the components, so we have the individual terms. Integrate the individual terms, so this should be x, this would be a half x squared, and this would be a third x cubed, plus the manipulations. Integrated between the limits of the beginning of the element at x equals 0 and the end of the element at x equals l, which are just the limits. And if you do those, it turns out that this is equal to a third L, the term that is on the, um, the diagonal, this term here. And the other term is this, uh, yeah, this other term here, which is this. Again, however you want to integrate it, just writing it out in longhand gives you a sixth L once you've made the substitutions. And so if you substitute those back in for the right locations for the first one here and the second one here, then you get this relationship here, which I think is curious. It's curious because if you take, for instance, um, this and rewrite it as the specific storage as one term, and you take these other two terms together, the length of the element and the area of the element, then by definition, these are the volume of the element, and then re-multiply them by these same terms of a third, a third, and a sixth, a sixth. If you add all these terms together, clearly a third is actually two sixths, so two sixths, two sixths, one sixth, and one sixth together. If you add them all together, then you end up with one in this term. And so physically, in the physical meaning, what this is saying is that it's taking this property, which is some property that represents the element, and it's multiplying this property by the volume of the element to say what its magnitude is. And so one, one way about thinking about uh, specific storage is that, uh, what's the best way to, to maybe illustrate this, is that if you Take this element, and you imagine that above this element, you could plot, for instance, um, the head, which is the height of the effective hydraulic head that's acting on this element. And you could draw out this magnitude of head above here. Then the definition of specific storage is the volume of fluid that is released per unit area of aquifer per unit drop in hydraulic head. So it's physically saying that you start off with this head, it's not desaturating the aquifer, but it's say a confined aquifer which is um, with a, a head in the aquifer which is much higher than the top boundary of the aquifer, and so it's actually pressurized. If you drop that head a uniform amount, then what it's saying is that the amount of fluid that has to be removed from that portion of the aquifer to allow that pressure to change is equal to the specific storage times the volume times the change in head by definition. And so maybe it's more obvious in looking at um, heat, heat problems. Same, same argument applies. Actually, I won't go down that road right now. And so one physical way of, of looking at this would be to to say that um, if you take this 
element and I'll just draw it as a straight element here and you have originally oops didn't want to do that one thing I don't know what I did but I didn't want to do it and if you have some level of fluid head that's applied. If you change that by some amount delta H, so if this amount is delta H, then what it would is what this is saying is that oops, draw it in perspective. Then the amount of flow that comes out of here. Q is equal to the volume of the element multiplied by the change in head multiplied by specific storage. This is the physical volume that comes out of it. And so what this matrix relationship is saying, uh, if we draw it in this particular case, is that if you have this same element and if you change the head at one particular node by some amount, then this would be, say, this is node 1. So this would be delta H1. The change in head at node 1 goes from 10 to 9 uh, meters of head. Then physically what it's saying is that the amount of fluid that would come out of here would be equal to um, one third times the volume of the element times the specific storage times delta H1. And But also, as you do this, as you only pull the head down at this one location, then out of the other end of it would come this amount here. Um, no, sorry, not that amount. This amount here, which would be the same amount. It, but one sixth times the volume times the specific storage times delta H one. So in other words, we're only pulling the head down at this particular node, but some fluid is getting squeezed out of the system at one end, which would be Q. In our terms, this would be Q one, and also in our terms, this would be Q two. And it really just comes from. Uh, what this this relationship physically says, and it's really saying that Q1 and Q2 are equal to area times length, which is together a volume, right? Times material property, and multiplied by whatever the terms are in this matrix, multiplied by the I guess it's delta. Yeah. It's change in head at node 1 and the change in head at node 2. And so that's physically really what this means. So it's allowing, um, you can imagine, uh, sometimes these are referred to as, as mass matrices. If you're doing earthquake engineering on a building, tragedy in uh, uh, Taiwan notwithstanding, is that when you think of a, a frame building, you think of it as a bunch of girders that join each other, kind of like a, a matchstick model and the mass of that thing could be um, individual masses that are attached maybe at the the junctions of those girders and so that when you shake it then the, the, the model that, that would represent that is that the elasticity of the structure allows it to move around but it has certain mass f equals ma and that mass is what causes inertia to control the speed at which it would vibrate in its natural frequency and so those are mass matrices where when we talk about mechanical problems, the mass matrix will be actually derived from a, a matrix very similar to this, but will be defined as um, either a consistent mass matrix. I guess I'm trying to ref refine this terminology. Since finite element methods developed in solid mechanics, the, the models that were used were for solid mechanics vibration of structures. So you can either think that the mass is distributed throughout the building in some way, 
or that you lump it at certain locations. And with some locations to lump it would be at the individual jun junctions between the girders. And so the difference between representing the behavior as consistent mass or lump mass is that in lump mass, what we could do is that instead of dropping the head at node 1 and allowing fluid to squeeze out of both nodes 1 and nodes 2 to represent the overall mass that came up, the other thing, of course, you'd realize is that 2 sixths plus 1 sixth is 3 sixths, which is half of the volume. And if you think about what this means is if you use the shape functions to map this delta H term across here, then it's really giving you half of the change in overall uh, distributed head change in the system. So for instance, if you also drew down the head at this other location by another amount, delta H2, and if you drew the triangle for that, if you add the blue triangle and the red triangle together, you end up with a flat surface, the whole amount of fluid which is squeezed out of the system. And so physically what this is representing is that you draw down the head here, um, a third comes out of here, a sixth comes out of here, and that represents half of the flow that's coming out of the system. If you draw down it here for the second amount, then the converse will be. This stuff will come out from... Uh, this end, a third out of here, a sixth will come out of here for the blue one. Actually, I can do it for some reason. I can't. So in other words, this one would be um, a third would come out of here, and a sixth would come out of here. And I guess those would be, that would still be Q1, but it would be due to delta H2. So probably more information than we need right now. I've done it anyway. So the other thing that we could do is we could add these two terms together. And that's just a convenience. And what that would allow us to do is if we do that, then if we add them together, we get this behavior here, which is so-called a lumped mass system, which now in a physical sense says that if you draw down the head at this location here, then the amount that you would produce, well, I can draw it, I suppose, would be what? So in other words, this is delta H1. Then the flow at location one would be the volume times specific storage times this. And if you did it for, I've done it backwards here, of course, but terms of the blue and the red and and nothing would come out of here so in other words q2 is equal to zero but when you do the second one then you'd have the, the converse q2 would be equal to the volume times specific storage times a half delta h2 and q1 would be equal to zero delta H2. So, again, in this class, I think it's important to get a physical feel for what's going on. All this is is that we're releasing fluid from the system. And we're releasing fluid from the system when we drop the head by some amount. And we have to find some logical way to be able to distribute that. We could distribute it so that when you drop the head at one particular node, the amount of storage that is released comes not only from this node here in some certain amount, but also from the other node, because it's distributed consistently across the element, in which case we'd use this. Or if we added these two terms together, we could just make it perhaps more intuitive that if you drop the head here, all the stuff that comes out comes out of here. Um, I suppose you could also, I mean, the other thing that you could look at is that suggests this, does it bear it out or not? I'm looking at the... You know, the relative... No, it's not quite, is it? It's... Um, I'm trying to think about the relative areas under this triangle. And so this would be um, a quarter, wouldn't it? 
you divide it up into these parts. Each, each one of these four regions would be the same area, just under the shape function. And so this would be um, three quarters here and one quarter here, which is not this distribution. Um, so it, it doesn't break up that way. But basically, you're, you're mapping it over the system. So, okay. Um, well, I said we do it in terms of um, isoparametric elements as well. There's no reason we can't do that. So you calculate what the storage matrix is in isoparametric elements. Um, I don't know that we need to spend much time doing that, but you can see exactly the same uh, result. Here we have the shape functions. They get substituted in here. If we go through the math with this Jacobian term, which we know what it is, and we, we do the, um, the math, we end up with exactly the same relationship. And the relationship is that it has a volume. This is V. Specific storage. And a half. Each of these is a half in here. And this is after doing it for the other terms, which is, I guess, uh, 2.66 over 8 has to be one third, right? This, this term divided by 8 is one third. This is one sixth. One third, one sixth. So it's, it's no different. So I'm not sure there's any great um, benefit in us slogging through that. But it's exactly the same result if we do it using isoparametric mapping. And so if we regroup briefly, uh, we've said we want to do two things. You first want to know what this relationship is. We do know what it is now, uh, and we can evaluate it directly for one-dimensional problems or for two-dimensional problems or three-dimensional problems as well, as long as we know what the shape functions are, we know how to do that. And the next thing that we need to know is how to be able to, to use that in a useful way to be able to figure out exactly how to take care of this time derivative so that instead of an equation that looks like this, we end up with one that has only a, ax equals b. So that's the, the next step. So it turns out that this relationship here for uh, the time derivative is really that the time derivative is just the rate of change with time of a the magnitudes in the nodal uh, head vector and uh, we can also write this in using uh, finite differences for instance as H uh, H T plus delta T minus H T divided by delta T. So what we could do is we could write this as a finite uh, derivative. If we, for instance, know what the heads were at a previous time step, and we wanted to project them to know what they are in the future, then we could write this derivative out in some way and resubstitute it back into this relationship and solve it. And so that's what, exactly what we'll attempt to do. And what it turns out is there are two ways of which we can think about this. We could think about writing it in the future and looking back, or we could write it at the present and look forwards to be able to, to figure out how we do it. And the way that we set up the relationships, matrix relationships, uh, depend on that kind of uh, point of view. But all of the relationships will um, rely on us writing this as a, a finite derivative. So what is this? This is really time stepping, I guess. And our motivation is to be able to write out this, this uh, finite derivative. And so if you think of the head at a particular node, or anywhere in the, in the, the, the mesh, but at a particular node is the easiest way to think about it, we can imagine knowing what the value of that head is at some time. And that would be this point here. If we look forward by some time step, which we'll call delta t, don't worry about this other stuff here. Then we could think that we might know what the value of the head is at that time, uh, next time step. 
if we assume that between those two time steps, we since we don't know anything better to be able to extrapolate otherwise, we can just draw in the, as a straight line. Then by definition, the gradient of this line would just be delta H over delta T. And if we know what delta T is, then we'd also know what the full, these would be in the same proportion as each other. But I guess the true value of our delta H would be between these two points. And we could put ourselves at some location in between these two points, a time, an intermediate time, in which case we'd have this different head defined, which is what this tau represents. So we said before that when we write this equation that for our system, you'll remember that we used tau here. And the reason is that we could write this equation at any time. We could write it at t plus delta t, we could write it at t, or we could write it at any time between those. And it should be just fine, because they're they would all exist on this little plot here. So if we want to know what the, the time derivatives are that occur in our equation for each node, so this would require that, you know, this is, these are the heads at some particular, these, these are vectors of, of heads, and this is just writing them out. If you can, it's not very well written. This is t plus delta t minus head at time t. fainter and this is so so this is true and this is just saying that since this is written at some time tau we could write it here or we could write it here or here or here all of those this expression is going to be correct right because it's just a linear interpolation and so what we're going to do with this is we're going to use it uh, first of all in this this one one way of writing it and this is referred to as implicit time integration, just because of where we um, write the expression. So in other words, this is the matrix expression we have. This is the term that we want to be able to define. If we go back here, this is exactly the term that we have defined. So in other words, if we substitute this term here into this expression, then we can um, evaluate the expression. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the expression at time t plus delta t. When we talk about explicit methods, they differ only in that we write the time at time t. So in other words, this equation we're writing at this point here for implicit. For explicit, we'll write it here. That's the only difference. We'll only do the first one today. And so if we uh, write out our expression here, this is fine that we use the expression we had before. So this is this expression here. And so now um, this is the head that we're going to want to know. We don't know it. We know stuff in the past, but we don't know stuff in the future. And so we would we want to know this. Once this has been substituted into here, we want to know this. But we do know this, right? Because we're sitting at current time and we know it. So there's also a flux in here. Remember, these are flux boundary conditions that we apply. So even though this is in the future, this is a boundary condition, and therefore it's known. So we know this. So the only things we don't know are the values of heads at time t plus delta t. So if we substitute this expression into here, we end up with equation 5. So this is the term that is we've substituted for our h dot term. This is the time derivative. So we take the parts that we don't know, which are this part and this part, and we take the parts that we do know, blue, which are this and this, and we move this over to the left hand, the right hand side, and it has to go, of course, with this term here, and so this is this term, and so this and this go off to the right hand side. And so now, um, 
we don't know this, but we do know this, and we do know this. We know everything on the right-hand side. And so we can think of this as just a modified matrix, which we'll call K star. And we'll use this as a modified vector, what we'll call the load vector, which we'll call Q star. And the only reason for doing that is we do now have a set of equations of AX equals B. Normal mathematical term. We want to solve for X. We don't know what those are, but we know exactly what the other matrices are. So that's it. So all we've done is we figured out what the storage matrix is. We now get it. We figured out how to be able to replace this term, which represents this time derivative, and divide it into things that we do know and things that we don't know. We can rearrange the equation. And so now we have it in a way that can be solved just as a, a linear system of equations. And so we'll use that. So the obligatory um, one-dimensional example is to, to, to basically solve that. Right? So this is it. So we're going to do a very quick example. It becomes very trivial if you use just one element, so we'll use two elements. So we'll have a system that is a, a block. You could think of it as a block that's being cooled from the surface or that the head is being, the pressure is being set on the top surface and the pressure changes over time. It's uh, of infinite uh, extent, and so really it is a one-dimensional problem. The flows that we have within the system are only in this vertical direction, either up or down. And so we can isolate a single component of it, just as a column. It has conductance and specific storage. Two meters high, we represent it by two elements, which are shown here. And what we'll do is we'll start off with it with a uniform head equal one, which will be this value here. And this will be at t equals zero minus. So this is the initial head distribution. Then all of a sudden at time t zero, what we do is we make the head at the top boundary zero. So instead of being one, which it was, all of a sudden it's zero. And what it should do in response to that is that this is the, the head in terminology at t equals zero plus time, right? The other side of zero. Immediately before this point, it was this red line. Immediately after we apply this boundary condition, we'd quench it, say, with uh, cold water, be the same kind of idea. So the temperature here is now zero, except it's not a temperature problem we're dealing with. The head is now zero, and it has to respond to that. And it would respond to that by, over time, changing along these little contours or responding lines, so that time infinity, if we hold this value here equal one, and we hold this value here equal zero, then the final result is a straight line between. So we want to be able to solve the system equations. We have a conductance matrix, which you see we modify by adding a certain term to it, the storage matrix divided by whatever time step we use. And we have to modify the load vector, or the conductance term, the, yeah, the Q vector. So here is the, the working for it. We know that the K matrix is equal to area times conductance over length 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 we know the conductance is equal to 1 we know the air is equal to 1 just because it's easy meters squared and we know the length between these if this is 2 meters then this is indeed 1 meter so we have the terms that make up this matrix. We have the terms which make up the storage matrix, which is what? Area times length over 2 times 1, 0, 0, 1. And again, 1 times 1 divided by 2 times this. OK, what did I leave out? Specific storage. Specific storage has to be 2. 
And if that, that's the case, then 2 divided by 2 is equal to um, 1 on the leading diagonals. If we look at the uh, full matrix, conductance matrix, storage matrix, and flux vector, this would be conductance would be half of that, right? 1, 1. And then this would be the second one in exactly the same way that we've put these together. So this 2 comes from 1 plus 1. Likewise, for the storage matrix, this is exactly the same. I'll draw a line straight through this. And likewise here. So these are the storage matrices. So right now it's in, in this particular form. This is 1 plus 1. Um, we have to rearrange it for boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions are going to be that we prescribe the head at this point, and we also prescribe the head at this point for all time. So there is only going to be one dependent variable that we have to solve for. It's going to be the value at this intermediate point. So h2 is equal to what? Since we prescribe the heads at these two points here, then their known values, and so we can move the terms from one side of the equation to the other. So in other words, if head 1 is equal to, I guess it's the upper one, is it? Head 1 is equal to 0. Head 3 is equal to 1. And so what we can do is we can multiply these values here times the terms that occur here. So 1 times h1 added on here would be 1 times h1, which is this term here, right? So all we're doing is vacating it from these. So this term that comes from here is this. This term that comes from here, it's already a 0 actually, but it would be this would be plus 0 times h1. And then you do the same for the values here. This times h1 would be plus 0 times h3, if you want to do it. And these other terms come off as well. So, so that's rearrange the, the expression. We made the case that the only term that we have as an unknown really is this intermediate value, which we don't know. And so if that's the case, we can think of just drawing a line just as we did before. And we only have one equation left. It's this middle equation that we have to deal with. I can do it here as well, I suppose. And if that's the case, then the only terms which are relevant to us are going to be this k term times this, this storage term times this time derivative, and the terms on this right-hand side which are remaining. And so we can, if we want, put together the k matrix because we said that if we zip, zip up here, this K matrix, or equivalent conduct conductance matrix, is going to just be modified by this term here. And so, in other words, we have this is going to be this. Storage is going to be 2. Choose a time step. I think up at the top we've chosen a time step of a tenth of a second, uh, which is this. And so in other words, the magnitude of this k vector, instead of being uh, just 2, is going to be equal to 2 plus 20, which is uh, 22. Likewise, the term that is here has to be modified to be this uh, Q star term, here. and it's going to be equal to the, the other load vector plus an extra term. I guess we know that this term 
is going to be equal to 20, just from what we did to the calculated what it is here. Actually, the term here is going to be 20. Not this outer part. Forget that. And if we do that, uh, this is the term here that's 20. So this is 1 over delta t times s. So this is 20. This is the bound, modified boundary condition for H3. And so the value of Q for this first iteration becomes uh, 1 plus 20, which is 21. And since in this case we only have one equation that we have to deal with, we if I keep them all on the same page, this is K star, which is this. This is Q star, which is this. And if we calculate what H2 is, it comes out to being, I guess it's equal to uh, 21 over 22. be an easier way to, to write it. Less, less than 1. So it starts off at 1 and then becomes less than 1. And so in other words, if we wanted to write this as a recurrence relationship, this would be, uh, the recurrence relationship would be 22 times h2 is equal to 1 plus um, 20 times h2. Except that um, this would be the value of H2 from the previous iteration. In other words, the head at time t, and this would be the head at time t plus delta t. That's, I guess that's the, the one difference that we have to keep in mind. And so if you went through this recurrence relationship, you could do it in Excel. Um, you could calculate now what the next um, solution would be. So we have a value for head 2 calculated from this, which is 21 over 22. So now you go back to this recurrence relationship. You update this term on the right-hand side, which is this term here, 0. It will always just have 1 plus 1 over delta t, and this is the old value of this magnitude. If you substitute that in there, you end up with a number which is whatever this is. So it ends up going from 0.955 to 913. And if you keep on going through it, it, it just it reduces itself. And so it's not a very good figure here. In fact, it's a horrible figure. But if you do it for, if you follow this for the cases we just looked at, then it looks like this. So if you choose a time step of 0.1 that we chose, then I suppose the first one would be at 10 to the minus 1. I suppose the first, this value here must be 0.945, the value at the next time step, so on, and you go down this trajectory. If you choose a bigger time step, you end up with a different trajectory. If it's 1, then the first value you'd get would be 0.77 or something like that, this value here. You can just use that relationship we had. If you use the larger time step of 2, the first value would be 2, and it would be this value here. And so you notice a couple of things. One is that if you use a bigger time step, then progressively you get a different response. Uh, they all asymptote to the same value, which is 0.5. It makes sense that they should asymptote to the same value of 0.5, because if you look at this trace here, that it starts off at uh, 1, ends up at 0, and a straight line between those would be this point here, which is 0.5. So we're only getting the value for the head at this particular intermediate location. And so they should end up at this intermediate point of 0.5, and they do. They all get there. Uh, if you use a time step of 0.1, then you come down this trajectory, which is this, which I'm outlining in a blue line. If you use a smaller time step, in which case you'll do 10 times more calculations, right? Because you'll start off at uh, 100, then it's 200, then 300, four one hundredths. You come down exactly the same trajectory. And so although for um, the first one, 
where it's equal to 0 0.1, it would only start at this location and then go down here. If you started for uh, one hundredth, it would end up on exactly the same trajectory, which you see is not the case for these larger values. And so at some stage, the time step is sufficiently small that you get the exact result, kind of. I say kind of because I'll qualify it in a minute. If you use a larger result, you still get a stable and reasonable steady state solution, but your trajectory towards that is not as accurate as the other ones were. So there's, there's that issue. The reason I used a qualifier to represent the fact that this is the exact solution is that it isn't the exact solution, right? Because the solution that this is physically representing, if I draw it out, is one element on top of a second element. And if you look at maybe drawing here, is if you look at drawing, for instance, uh, the value of head with location along the element, this is z, I suppose, and we only get it at one point, which is this intermediate point, is we've said that it starts off looking like this, where this is 1, and it ends up looking slightly different, where the final value is this. And so the real system would have these curved paths, but our actual system, as it modifies to, get to look like this, in the first time step, it will look like this, where this value here must be 0. Point, what was it? 9, I think it was 945 or 54, I can't remember. And so it's kind of a bi, uh, bilinear fit, right? It's not a curved fit. The next one would be something that would be here with two straight segments, as straight as I can draw them. The third one would be here, etc. The real solution, if we looked at this, would actually, if you looked at the true case, maybe for a hundred of these elements, which would represent the true solution. Should have done it a different color. I should use green for these, right? Would actually, uh, the first value would look like this. The second value would probably look like this depending on the time step. And then the third value would look like this. Fourth, this. And then the ultimate value, time infinity. If you believe that's a straight line, then that would look like this. It looks like someone's eyes, not infinity, but that's fine. So the point is that even though they all overlay each other on the exact trajectory, uh, they don't really asymptote. They're, they're an absolutely true s solution to this two-noted, two-element two system, three-noted, two-element system. But they're not an exact solution to the true geometry. And so it's useful to think about discretization not only in uh, space, but in time. So here, the discretization in time is good enough to give you the exact solution because you come down this trajectory. Um, if you did it for a thousandth of a second or a millionth of a second, you'd still come down the same trajectory. They'd be identical. But it wouldn't represent the true system because you're not actually representing the true physical system through your the density of the elements in there. So, so that's it. So that's it. Um, uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, we can look at trying maybe uh, using uh, Comsol to do that. Let's do that just for a break. Everyone see what we're doing. So we need to to, to represent this uh, linearized expression, which includes this term storage matrix or the capacitance matrix multiplied by H dot. There are two parts to it. We need to figure out what the storage matrix is. We have a physical representation of what that is, and we now know how to do it for these simple elements, one-dimensional elements, and by inference also for two-dimensional uh, more complicated elements. Um, and secondly, we need to be able to split the expression up to be able to follow it 
in time, and we need to be able to uh, deal with this extra term that we have we talked about here. And so we need to know what the S matrix looks like. We know how to do that. We need to know how to split it up in time so we get a set of equations which are AX equals B.